Welcome to another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. I know we want to get into the action, but I have to ask that you help me armor us up a bit for the bumpy road ahead. Because I bring you the first hour of this show without unrelated ad nonsense as a proof of concept. And if you value it, then come over to THC Plus for the $8 a month and hear the full two-hour interviews as they were designed to be and as you would enjoy them most. Go to thehiresidechats.com or just click the link in the show notes to get started and within a minute you'll be plugging in your new Plus Show RSS feed into a hopefully decentralized podcasting 2.0 supported app. Feed the things you want to grow and starve the things that gotta go and we will reach the promised land. Think about that and enjoy the show. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Hey there, cool cats and kittens from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and while the daily grind and the nightly news can take up all of our time and mental energy, as they seem designed to do, when you expand your awareness beyond the pre-approved boxes and engineered distractions of the moment, you find many more mysteries yet to be explained. Why are there ancient pyramids all over the planet? Why do people who explore the occult come away with a near-unanimous consensus that one can manifest their own reality and attract their own desires? And why do stories of interactions with strange types of beings go back as far as writing itself across nearly every culture, and we still don't have a satisfactory answer as to what they are or what they want? Well, whether there's a single thread that weaves through these themes is yet to be determined, but it's the mystery surrounding the long-standing relationship humanity seems to have with something else, is the offering on the higher side table today with a guest who has a pretty unique and compelling take on the subject. His name is Ryan Musgrave Evans, and through a deep investigative process of cross-comparison through many known and unknown accounts of contact, whistleblowers, and experiencers, He vets the accounts as reported and hones in on the details, large and small, that lend credibility to the stories and his overall thesis as to what these encounters are all about. And it's all backed up by his own personal encounters, too. He lays the case out in his excellent new book, Children of Orion, Finding the Crypto Terrestrials, and it's a pleasure to have him here. The alien encounter, analyzer, fairy folklore informer, and newly crowned king of the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis, Ryan, welcome to the higher side. Hey, Greg, thanks for that. That was a wonderful introduction. I've got to live up to that now. (laughs) Yeah, just doing my job, you know. (laughs) Thank you. This is a real pleasure. And shout out to Ryan Burns of Hero Paranormal for hooking us up. Ryan knows I am a big fan of anything inner earth, and that is a big part of your position. And you do a great job comparing fairy folklore accounts to modern alien encounters, looping in several other strange types of interactions. And we're obviously going to get into a lot of the details and why you conclude what you conclude over the course of the next two hours. But how would you describe the overall case we're looking to make? Describe the blanket hypothesis here, because it is a pretty unique position. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the hypothesis in a nutshell is that these beings that are behind the UFO phenomenon, close encounter phenomena that people have been subjected to and experiencing and reporting for many years now, that these beings are indigenous to this earth rather than being extraterrestrials or as some would say as well and suggest extrasolar even where lots of people when they're speculating about these kinds of issues they suggest they're probably from even way beyond our solar system too the crypto terrestrial idea came from mac tony's now i rely heavily on his term crypto terrestrials in my book because i've decided that in my opinion it's the closest match to the beings that are behind the UFO phenomenon and the abduction phenomena, close encounter phenomena in general. Now, Mac Tony's, when he formulated that idea and his hypothesis, the crypto terrestrial hypothesis, he floated it out there like an alternative to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. 
which he considered to be dogmatic. And he himself didn't necessarily think it was any more than a thought experiment, but he just at least wanted it out there to enrich ufology and have a few different options because he considered the extraterrestrial hypothesis to really not necessarily be the definitive answer to this. He was unsettled by the notion that people were presuming these beings behind these phenomena to be true aliens without any evolutionary history with the Earth or with us because there's this running theme that everyone into ufology and ETs and aliens will be familiar with hearing that they're interested in our DNA, or that's a theme, a motif that's constantly repeated, or very often repeated anyway, in a lot of cases. They seem to be interested in our DNA, harvesting our DNA, sometimes even interbreeding with us, copulating with us in the old-fashioned way, literally, such as cases like the 1957 case from Brazil of Antonio Villas Boas, or the famous case from Sydney, Australia from 1992 with Peter Curry. These beings would appear to be very, very closely related to us, have a genetic affiliation as to almost be us. And for this kind of compatibility between our genetics and our genomes, McTony said, it seems much more likely that these beings, if they're real, are from here. They're indigenous to this planet, which does not necessarily mean they're not spacefaring as well and extraterrestrial in certain ways. So this was McTony's basic idea, and, and so I've taken his term crypto-terrestrial, which literally translates to hidden earthlings, and also McTony's, I'll just quickly add as well, he was heavily influenced by Jacques Vallée, especially Jacques Vallée's early work, like his seminal book, Passport to Magonia, where Jacques suggested that beings and characters from ancient folklore, he particularly focused on the Celtic fairy faith from Europe, he likened those non-human humanoid beings in the older stories to the phenomena of today and the characters and reports and beings that are described by people nowadays that claim to have encounters. And Jacques Vallée suggested that these may be an identical group of beings that have been here always with us, interacting with us. And McTony's was heavily influenced by that idea. McTony's decided that there was no need really to suggest that they might be paraphysical, metaphysical. He tried to pull it back from being too esoteric and make it more nuts and bolts and flesh and blood maybe than Jacques Vallée had done. So that's McTony's crypto-terrestrial hypothesis, that there's a sister species, or related to us in a very close way anyway, that is interacting with us with robust technologies that can manipulate our minds, influence our memories, influence their appearance to us cloaking and living under the earth or in our mountains or under the sea but here with us permanently as a presence that's been running down through the millennia and what i've done with my book children of orion is now i am an experiencer myself and i have been all my life and many of my experiences are becoming more intense and regular in the past few years but i have had sporadic contact with what I thought were elves or fairies all through my childhood and adolescence and whatnot. And then when I moved back down to where I grew up as an adult, in about 2010 that would have been, but the interactions became more intense. And then around about 2013 or 2014, it really started taking off with really high scale contact. But what I've done with my book is I've, the beings that I know, that I've seen, that I've interacted with, what I set out to do was try and be as objective as possible and in a way sort of pose as a researcher. But first and foremost, I'm an experiencer, but I try to push that aside. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch an investigation into old folklore running through the ages, but specifically, mostly the Celtic fairy faith, as Jacques Vallée did, coming up to the beginning of the UFO era, which people often talk about as being 1947 with the Roswell crash. Cases through that time, coming up to more modern cases like Charles Hall, Peter Curry, Chris Bledsoe, Kelly Kale, and yeah, just utilizing all of these cases and trying to find the beings that I know and have experienced within these cases. And so what I did was I started making what I called a crypto terrestrial profile or ct profile and i moved through the cases 
using initially the reports of the Gaelic fairies like Nahuishlan from uh, Ireland and Scotland that were tall fair beings that chirped and whistled, that lived underground, that would float around as will-o'-wisp, as luminous beings and things at dusk, would use what was called glamoury on peoples to alter their realities, to present false appearances to people so they'd look like things that they weren't. Perhaps even look like people that you'd know yourself. I began with that and then sought them in other cases. And then if people are familiar with, say, Charles Hall's case, the millennial hospitality books that he wrote, claimed to be a weather observer in the United States Air Force at Nallis, Creech Air Force Base, in um, the 60s and have regular prolonged interaction with a race of beings that he said were tall and fair, big blue eyes that would chirp and whistle, that lived underground and in the mountains that would mess with his mind that would float around on the horizon at dusk as luminous forms so you've got these stark parallels of characteristics so as i'm creating this compendium of characteristics or traits of behavior appearance language histories kinds of technologies or magic as it would have been called in the old days these are the same entities that i have known all my life which people would normally in ufology call either Nordics or tall whites. After Charles Hall's book, he called them tall whites, and that term sort of stuck as an alternative term for them. But pre-Charles Hall's books in the early 2000s, people would normally have referred to them more often as Nordics. And then I continue to look for them using this compendium of characteristics, finding new cases that seem to have these same beings in them with barking, growling speech, whistling, chirping speech, big blue eyes, fine white hair, etc. and so on. And then each new case serves to reinform the list and add extra traits to bulk it out to aid in finding more cases with the same beings and building it and building it to get a clearer picture of these people, these crypto terrestrials. Mm -hmm. Well, that is definitely a good summary. And let's get a little deeper into this idea that these beings described as fairies, aliens, and angels are really the crypto terrestrials living among us and that they use advanced technology to mystify us. I love the idea. I often call the Earth a human terrarium because I think it's fun. I like Charles Fort's conclusion that we are property. You write in the book, Mac Tony suggested in his book that the crypto terrestrials perhaps are masquerading as ETs because they don't want us to know about their entrenched presence here. Or, as you say in the book, to quote Terrence McKenna, we are part of a symbiotic relationship with something which disguises itself as an extraterrestrial invasion so as to not alarm us, which is just <laughs> such a fun paradoxical statement. You also say that to them, we are free-range ancient humans which is circling around the same type of thing, but it is a little different. Break that phrase down for us. Free-range ancient humans. That's maybe a, a word that people wouldn't expect to see in there, ancient. Ah, uh, yes. Well, that's actually an element that I just left out of my book in a nutshell. So I didn't... <laughs> you're right to pick me up on that because I, I actually forgot to mention that element, which is a very important one, that the investigation, as I carry it out, hints more and more to them being future versions of ourselves. So not only are they, have they been here for a very long time with us in our timeline interacting with us, their reason for being here and their, their origin really is a distant future of ours. Their reason for returning is to repair and reinvigorate failing genomes. And we are to them ancient versions of themselves that are healthier in certain respects because they have a lot of maladies and pathologies that have come about for a slew of different reasons. Some of them are negative mutations, but a lot of it has to do with the detrimental elements of deliberate genetic engineering for extended periods of time where they have sought to extend their own lifespans and improve themselves physically in certain ways. But genomes are a holistic, systemic, naturally evolved system that really, if you deliberately choose to alter it in certain ways, unforeseen symptoms and side effects 
will arise all over the place that you hadn't planned upon. And this is what has happened to them, where they can live for a very, very long time. If they're lucky, they can live as long as seven to 800 years. And they reach massive heights of up to nine and 10 foot. They slowly continue to grow. But they are very susceptible to diseases, certain pathologies, maladies, as I said, and also injuries. They take a long time to physically heal. So they can die from a broken bone. A broken bone, there would be nothing overly damaging to us, can be lethal to them. And they require for their new generations to bolster their own DNA with some of our ancient DNA. DNA from themselves from ancient times before we began to mess with our own DNA. And deliberately, like I was talking to someone about this the other day, and they said, oh, you'd think that futuristic humans would have solved all these problems, that they would have conquered cancer and disease and would be able to heal themselves at dramatic rates if they had physical damage, injuries. But it's that kind of thinking that got them in the mess in the first place. Yes. Think, thinking that a naturally evolved genome can be altered and clipped and tampered with and not have any repercussions. And so they haven't been able to fix themselves through interfering more deliberately. So they have come back to the source, which is us as we are now at a time before and us in our recent past as well. And they went back into our past, really. They've been here for thousands of years now after having come from a future time. So it gets very complicated, but they require us to bolster themselves and to reinvigorate themselves, really. And so that's what I mean by saying, yeah, free range, archaic humans. Mm -hmm. Right on. But yes, man, I love this stuff. And the reason I'm probably most attracted to your position is I see a lot of parallels with the mindset of scientists today and what they're doing. Genomic alteration sounds a lot like the science headlines that I'm seeing. So I just think it's compelling that we might be at some kind of uh, point in the in the timeline where like we might be repeating the very same problems potentially, potentially. But elaborate on this technology aspect, because when people have these encounters, we put them in the paranormal box because of some of the astonishing things that happen. And when you talk about encounters, you usually talk about the suits that they might be wearing and the qualities of those suits and mind reading technology. Help us see these strange encounters through that technical lens rather than something mystical, esoteric, or supernatural. This might be the hardest pill to swallow in your thesis for some people in this audience who might think, well, what about this case? What about that case? But help us understand how this could all be done through advanced technology. Okay, yeah, for sure. Well, through the book, I gradually build a picture of these suits that they wear. Now, I have seen them myself as well, but I wanted to find them in other cases and demonstrate to people that these particular suits that I call Boas suits, B-O-A-S, and I named it after Antonio Villas Boas, the famous case from Brazil where he met these pale-skinned beings, huge blue eyes, white hair. They weren't very tall. So you'd say, well, were they tall whites? They weren't very tall, but they, tall whites take a very long time to grow, as Charles Hall talks about in his Millennial Hospitality book. So a five-foot-tall white is still going to be, probably be about 40 years old, like F-O-R-T-Y, 40, not 14 or 50 even years old. So he saw these barking, growling beings, but they were wearing these tight suits with goggles and headgear. And I was sort of, I was thinking that was the first example of one of these suits in sort of the modern UFO era being witnessed. Now, Kelly Kale, Christopher Bledsoe Sr., Charles Hall himself in his fifth book, which I could go into a little bit later, where he thinks he was interacting with tall greys, but in my opinion, these were just tall whites wearing these suits as well. These suits, they have goggles that glow red at night. They have a helmet that has telepath tech in it. it has, so these beings, the tall whites, or Mudgina, they call themselves, um, or P-52 Orions, 
and we can get into why they are Orions as, as well at a later stage, but even though they're indigenous to this earth, they've had an association with Orion, and that's why they're children of Orion, but I can talk about that again a bit later. But the suits themselves have a long nose-like appendage that comes up from the, that goes on over the top and covers some of their helmet and then hangs down their face. Then they have like a breathing apparatus under that tight, dark outfit with like a circular technology on the front as well. Usually black or dark gray in appearance, but these suits cloak and they can be completely invisible. So that you just would not know they were there at all. Or sometimes they have a slight shimmery heat haze look that's been made famous by the likening these kinds of suits to the effect that the alien had in the old Predator movie franchise with Arnold Schwarzenegger and whatnot. But this kind of sort of shimmering look sometimes, or otherwise just completely invisible. These suits can levitate. If they levitate while they are visible, they sort of blur over and get a nebulous sort of cloud look to them that starts to shimmer and move and actually sort of makes them indistinct looking and then they they lift off the ground they have a field that they can implement there that makes them invulnerable um to bullets or people trying to attack them with any kind of sharp weapon or these suits as well have an ability to become intangible so that they can pass through walls through solid objects the nose piece I don't actually talk about what the nose piece is for in the book, but this is something that I've come to understand since. That the nose piece is most likely to replicate and resonate and amplify sounds that they are making themselves. They make a lot of animalistic sounds, so they have different kinds of languages. Their normal, original, natural language sounds a little bit like Japanese or Korean. It isn't Japanese or Korean, but if there were languages spoken on the earth today that sounded the closest to the way these guys speak when they're speaking their natural language, it would be Japanese or maybe Korean. But they also have camouflage languages that mimic wildlife. And so they sound like dogs barking, growling, chirping birds. Uh, they, they have this sound that sort of, sometimes they sound a bit like a monkey or a fox, like the laughter that a fox makes. And they can also make massively loud bellowing and roaring sounds and whoops to communicate over long distances in which case this extra technology that is a nose piece is like an amplifier that goes up on the top of their skull as well over the top of their helmets inside the helmets is telepath technology so they're no more psychic or telepathic than we are naturally they rely on technologies for that or at least this race does there are other races apparently that are biologically telepathic that they've genetically engineered themselves to be like that but these guys aren't like that they're more like us in most ways and they use this telepathic technology to project into your mind linguistic statements or abstract ideas or images or fear visceral fear to repel or expel you from a place if you're too close to where their children are playing say or too close to where they have an underground habitation they're currently in. They move around the world and chase the heat. So in state and national parks all around the world, they'll have these underground bases, but they're not necessarily all always manned. But if you are somewhere they don't want you to be, they can uh, force fear into your mind. Or alternatively, if they judge you being able to read your mind, if they judge you as the kind of person that would maybe fight rather than flee if you were too scared, they'll use different methods and they might fill your mind with love and feelings of gratitude and try to disarm you and remove you as a threat with that tactic. So the shadow people are them. Now there might be some other kinds of elements coming into this. I don't know what to think about ghosts, residue of deceased humans moving around the world, haunting people or remaining in places where they died or where there was a traumatic experience or something like that. I really don't know whether those things exist, but I do know that these guys are responsible for most hauntings. If you've got poltergeist phenomena, if you wake up in the morning and your frying pan's in your freezer, or they've smashed glasses maybe, or you hear things smashing and when you get up there's actually no damage, people's voices, disembodied voices in the night, growling sounds, music playing, footsteps around the house, shadow people as I said, people standing over the top of you at night, sleep paralysis, sometimes sleep paralysis is them. 
as well. Although, of course, sleep paralysis can be caused by other things as well. But so these guys, their technologies are so sophisticated that to us, they look something like magical about them, really, or spiritual or something like that, or sort of paraphysical or something like that. Well, these are nuts and bolts technologies that are used to dramatic effect that to us just appear as magic or something of the kind. Right on. And so if they are responsible for hauntings, is that because maybe a person lives too close to one of their tunnels or bases? I guess that'd have to be. Yeah, I think there are different reasons why someone would experience hauntings. You're right, that's one of them. People that are encroaching on areas, especially if towns are getting larger or people are building where they wouldn't have, where there were no Homo sapiens presence really at one stage. Houses and buildings and stuff that are sort of back onto wilderness areas or national or state parks perhaps as well. Yeah, this can attract their attention. Not necessarily in an aggressive way, but sometimes in an aggressive way. They try to repel or expel people from a place if they think that they're just too close to their children, too close to their own business. Like the Skinwalker Ranch case is probably the most famous case of the tall whites, the Mudjana, driving a family through psychological warfare off their land because they're too close to where they've got their own things going on, their own business going on. Especially if they read your mind, they can tell that you have aggressive tendencies towards them. If you own dogs as well, this can really annoy them. They kill a lot of dogs. They kill a lot of our dogs. They're sort of conflicted. And <laughs> sometimes people say these are all contradictions because they also have, they're vegetarian or they're vegans, really. They don't eat any animal products. They don't even wear animals, any clothing made from animal materials. And they have a strong respect for the earth and for the maintenance of this biosphere. But if they feel threatened, they can be lethal. And when it comes to, they don't keep pets themselves and they don't really understand that impulse that we have. And when it comes to our guard dogs and things like that, if they feel threatened by dogs, they'll slash their throats or they'll kill them in other ways. They wear uh, long two-inch prosthetic claws as part of these boa suits as well. They have clawed fingers. Four long fingers with a tiny vestigial thumb further up their hand yeah so that's one reason for haunting us another reason for haunting us is breeding programs where like the case of peter curry and like happened to Antonio villas boas where they had sexual encounters with mudjana or tall whites well in the ancient irish fairy and gaelic scottish and irish fairy faith there was a being called anjan and she the fairy lover and it would be a beautiful woman that would come to male mortals or a man that would come to females. And they'd either summon the mortal away for trysts elsewhere or they'd visit them in their home. And then you've got that parallel with the current ET related stuff as well. Mm. Um, now, some people belong to their breeding programs as well, which is supposed to be voluntary. The problem with that is and I think a lot of people listening to this will find that there's a bit of an ethical issue with this. I agree, actually. If you are part of their breeding program, and sometimes you have sort of like half-remembered sort of like succubus or incubus interactions and things like that, at some stage you have said yes to it, but you might not remember being asked. Now, that's a sort of an ethical issue there. If you've been asked for permission and they've said to you, can you help us save our race you are going to be protected by us. You will have certain benefits by being associated with us. We can help you and improve your own health, keep you living longer than you would have normally lived and all these kinds of things. If they ask you and you say yes, they're not going to let you remember it. They're not going to let you remember many of the encounters and they won't even let you remember most likely, won't let you remember having said yes to it, even though you have. So that gets sort of a bit messy there. Well, I do think that from a lot of different sources, I've heard that it seems like the universe runs on contracts and deals and agreements and this rule that you can't violate free will. A lot of people might try to find loopholes to that, whether it's the elite or demons that have been summoned or these beings. It just seems like I hear that so much as a theme that man, I want to just steamroll these people, but I can't, I can't. I got to get them to agree. I got to get them to invite me in. And 
it's just interesting to hear that in this context as well. Yeah, yeah, it does seem to work like that, particularly with them as well. They have a sophisticated system of, of agreements and treaties, and they have had treaties with, you know, the powers that be, the people that run our world, whoever they are. Right. Yeah, signed treaties, and at different stages have thought that it might be a beneficial thing for the world to reveal themselves, at which times they're usually told by the Homo sapiens power structure, no, no, you shall not reveal yourselves because there'll be too much panic, etc. and so on. I mean, we can be very cynical about this. If these beings were to show themselves, they have access to wonderful technologies. If they were to share even a fraction of it with us, we would have free energy. It would be wonderful for the earth and the biosphere and everything. And there are a lot of people in powerful positions in the Homo sapiens structure that are benefiting from the current status quo and no access to these free energies. So this is all part and parcel to it. But yeah, they do make agreements. And as far as I'm concerned, it seems to be either they have decided to ignore the human power structure and are deciding to just begin to interact with more people because they feel like it and the Earth's in trouble now and so they've really, we've done our dash basically and they want to reveal themselves and help and steer things down a different channel. Or there is a possibility as well, in fact, this is probably more likely, that the Homo sapiens power structure has now decided it is time and everyone's in agreement. The beings themselves, whoever you want to call, you know, clandestine groups like Majestic or whatever they would call themselves nowadays, or if you don't believe that Majestic 12 ever existed, whatever kind of entity, whatever kind of system in place of powerful people in the know that are governing things in the background the dudes behind the curtain you know right that there seems to be maybe some kind of consensus happening now so it's not that the beings are necessarily being more defiant than they would have been before it's actually that everyone has decided okay that's the end it's time <laughs> it's time now we've put it off as long as we could you know that might be the scariest premise of all but man so vegans who Arrogantly obsessed over science and medical genetic intervention. Got it. The future is a liberal wet dream. Uh, cool. Well, uh, you know, uh, just messing around. But hey, I also interviewed this guy, Pierre Sabac, who he calls these beings angelic sailors. He also looks at the cross comparative stuff, mainly between biblical angel accounts and modern UFO encounters. But he expressed it as beings who mastered wave particle duality, which is obviously like a technology thing. I mean, another way to look at it is they possibly could be spiritual beings that can manifest physically for a short time. And I'm undecided on really what to think of all that. And it kind of gets to be semantics. If you're a being that can remove itself from physical reality, I mean, <laughs> we're splitting hairs. But let's get into why... The name of the book is Children of Orion, because I have so many questions and we're just breezing through here, almost done with an hour already. But so many mysteries have this Orion overlap. So many ancient structures and traditions flesh out this connection for us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, like probably the most famous example of a man-made structure that seems to conform to Orion constellation and the stars is the pyramids. The Pyramids of Giza, right. the Al Natak, Al Nalam, and Mintaka, the three stars of Orion's belt, are there represented in perfect relationship relative to each other as the layout of Orion's belt. And then pyramids in Central America, South America are of similar layouts, and, and all through other parts of America as well. I think there's a guy called, I can't remember his surname at the moment, is it Gary David? The guy who wrote Mirrors of Orion, and he's written a couple of different books relating to this and finding as many structures as he can around the world that seem to conform to this layout. So that's interesting in itself. But in the Antonio Villas Boas case, where, you know, he's a Brazilian farmer who was working on his tractor at night to escape the heat of the day, and he had had interesting UFO experiences previous to this main encounter, but he saw what looked like a red star approaching. He realized it was a craft that landed. These beings clad in these dark suits grabbed him, pulled him on board. I think they rubbed some kind of like a gel 
over his body. They gassed him. They also took some blood from his chin, like they nicked his chin. And then they left him in a room where he had a sexual encounter with a female. Now, over the door, and then I think afterwards they showed him around the craft and then they booted him out. But over the door of the craft were what he said were looked like hieroglyphs or writing. And he reproduced those. Now, these symbols are things that I've seen myself in my own encounters. And also another experiencer of tall whites from Spain, Julio Fernandez in 1978, I think it was. He had mental images projected into his mind of some of these symbols as well. But these symbols, and people can look them up online if you type in Antonio Villas Boas hieroglyphs or Antonio Villas Boas writing and look up on Google Images or something, you'll find them. But in amongst these lines and hieroglyphs, there's three dots. And the three dots conform to Orion's belt as well. Now, that may be just a coincidence in itself, but this is a recurring theme. So you find, for example, as well, the case of Christopher Bledsoe Sr., who is famous for the 2007 Fayetteville incident. I mean, he, after that point, he has had a lot of different experiences in his whole family, lots of poltergeist experiences, shadow people. Yes, we did have him here a few months ago, and I was lucky enough to, to spend some time with him. But what a wild case. Nice. Yeah, the very wild case. Yeah, intense. Like, it's got to be like the most intense multiple witness event on record, I'd say. Or if it's not, it's one of the top ones. Where he's, not only did his son see at the same time, his son also witnessed a lot of this. But the three contractors were there fishing as well, witnessed a lot of this stuff. But he, um, in Hypnotic Regression, recalled seeing this seven-foot being in his front yard, and he had a sketch artist do it for him. And the sketch is very, very close to the Crabwood Crop Circle image of 2002. Right. Now, the Crabwood Crop Circle image is famous because it has Orion's belt in it. Again, it's the three marks beside the being in the Crabwood Crop Circle image that has an image of a ET entity that's holding a disc with binary code on it. And sorry to interrupt, but just so people know, the message in binary that is included with that crop circle, maybe you're going to get to it, but it's beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. There is good out there. We oppose deception, conduit closing. And that's a very provocative and interesting message. I mean, who knows what they could be referring to? False gifts? Broken promises? Not from our governments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I th and also there's a possibility they're making reference there to another particular race of being right. that was a bit more negative. Like the craft that Bob Lazar, I believe Bob Lazar, by the way, I'll just say that right now, uh, even though there's lots of people in the UFO community that don't because his paper trail doesn't really add up. He doesn't have the qualifications according to the institutions he went to. This kind of thing. Well, this is run of the mill counterintelligence stuff anyway. If you're relying on those kinds of measures to ascertain so the truth value of someone's claim, who, when it comes to matters of national security, especially relating to the ET UFO question, you can't limit yourself, like, say, Stanton Freeman did, to investigating Bob Lazar purely on those grounds. I mean, if their backstory, if their qualifications are there, I would suggest that to be a red flag. <laughs> uh, it depends on how you look at it. But anyway, Bob Lazar yeah, himself. No, it's true. Uh, Bob Lazar himself, I, I do believe that dude. I also believe Dan Burrish, which makes me quite unpopular in ufology in general. But Dan Burrish definitely telling the truth. But so was Bob Lazar. Dan Burrish claimed to be a microbiologist in the 90s working at S4 as well. Dan Crane, his real name is. But So the craft that Bob Lazar was working on is belonged to... P forty five J rods. So they they were a sort of like a they're sort of like a grey, what in pop culture would be called a grey. But they supposedly are not as amiable and amicable and agreeable <laughs> as right. say the tall whites or some of the other ones, you know. I'm totally open to multiple beans for sure, but just to bring it back to children of of Orion. So we have all these Orion references that seem just disconnected and mysterious, but what is the story there and like 
these beans are us, but they are the children of Orion? Yeah, so for those people that understand what crypto terrestrial means and then see that the book's also called Children of Orion, would automatically be thinking, hold on, this is a contradiction, isn't it? Okay, so what it is is that they are a race that was indigenous to here, but in their own timeline, in a world that now will never be, not to us anyway, um, there were cataclysms and upheavals on the earth in the early 21st century in their own past that caused chaos and the end of civilization as people, as we know it. Now, there was a pole shift, so the solar flares, all of these elements caused all these massive disruptions on the earth. Some people, the elite in this narrative, in this paradigm, that I do believe is actually the true and explains the origin of these beings. The elites of the world had already been preparing for this and they went underground. The average Joes of the world were left to fend for themselves on the surface of the earth. Some survived and after thousands and thousands of years, the ones on the surface began to re-establish some sort of high level technologies and went to the moon. The ones that were descended from the wealthy elites that were underground, they stayed on the earth. The ones that went to the moon, more time passed, they went to Mars. I know I'm using past tense here, but it's not really... Language kind of breaks down because there's no real tense system to talk about this kind of thing. This is sort of like a potential reality. It's not the past, it's not the future, but anyway. So they went to Mars. They were there again for an extended period, thousands of years, before they finally left to where there were Earth-like planets, or a planet, I'm not sure if it's plural, orbiting the Alnalum star, or Epsilon Orionis, which is the middle star in Orion's belt. And they didn't come back. And then after a prolonged period of time, the people left on Earth that were descended from the underground elites, they began to perfect time travel. They travelled back to their ancient past and crashed at Roswell 24,000 years after. So the Roswell craft was a time machine, not a spacecraft really. But And then they stayed on the Earth for a prolonged period of time more and ended up going to Reticulum. So they ended up leaving Earth as well. And the ones in Reticulum came to be what people kind of think of as greys, although there's ones that were more a dark brown colour that are even from further in the future from the same system. Whereas the ones that were from Orion are what people call Nordics or tall whites. These two groups of individuals with impoverished genetic systems, codes, genomes, found each other again. Tens and tens of thousands of years into the future found each other again tried to help each other to repair each other's genetic problems, realized that neither of them could assist the other and there were elements missing from their DNA and decided to launch a joint operation to return to their ancient past and recolonize inside the earth to be using ancient versions of themselves as, like we were saying before, free-range archaic humans. And they're still here. So they are future humans, they're from our past, they're, they're here now, they're, it gets quite complicated. And then also the talking about time travel, it's debatable as to whether or not you could really call them time travelers, because it depends on what you mean by time travel. More like timeline travelers. Yeah, timeline travelers. So almost interdimensional travelers, really, because we're not really from their own past. We're from an alternative timeline that is for all intents and purposes, identical to their own ancient past without being it. Right. Anyway, so yeah, it gets very, very complicated. And there's no real shortcuts to a lot of this. Like, you sort of, you dive into this kind of stuff. And as I mentioned, Dan Burrish, and people often pull me up on that because he's one of the least believed characters or people in ufology really probably not many people believe dan burrish it has had a lot to do with some people that are very influential in ufology some of the figures in in modern ufology decided against him fairly early on and so he doesn't get much airtime people if they bother ever considering his testimony do so in a really derisive fashion 
Now, the odd thing about all this is one of the main movers and shakers that were anti-Dan Burrish, Mr. Knapp, <laughs> invited me onto his show and I was on Coast to Coast where he praised my book, which is heavily pro-Burrish. Now, we didn't embarrass each other by talking about Burrish. He's sort of like the elephant in the room. And the interview, other than audio issues, you know, went okay. And he was very friendly and he was very professional and, and seemed enthusiastic about the book and seemed to have genuinely read it as well. I could tell from those kinds of questions he was asking. So I think that is a bit of a milestone. I don't know if you could really pin the guy down and say to him, hey, do you support Burrish now or not? If you try to do something like that, I think that might embarrass him a bit and he might even deny it. <laughs> but certainly, it's, I think it's a symbolic interview. Right. Yeah. And congrats on that. And let me ask you this. So, well, with Dan Burrish, I know from your previous interviews that you asked these beans that you have a relationship with if he was trustworthy and they said yes. And that's good enough for me. Maybe we can get more of the details later. But because we are at that first and second hour split, it's hard to this isn't really, you know, let's wait a little bit before we get into that. But one more question I wanted to try to squeeze into this first hour is so. Just to summarize, we have these beings that are adjacent to us on a different timeline, a future timeline. They jump into our timeline because of their degraded genetics in what would be our ancient past. And then religions crop up around these experiences with these beings. Fairy lore crops up. I mean, even George Adamski, in his case, said that they told him that they were here the whole time and a lot of religions sprung up over these sightings and not knowing what to make of them. We've seen UFO cults come to being in the modern world. So it's not too far-fetched to think that. And of course, major themes between aliens and fairies are taking children and people and living alongside us and underground facilities. And a lot of the physical descriptions are a match too. And the major themes of abduction and genetics and interbreeding are in there, but also warnings to be good stewards of the planet. And I'm curious why this theme always comes up. Obviously, if they share the planet with us, they don't want us to destroy it. But why isn't it a stronger theme in UFO lore to warn us about CRISPR technology and cloning and global mRNA vaccination campaigns and genetic tinkering as much as they warn us about pollution and nukes? since their impoverished DNA is the key to their need to be here. You would think they would mention that, like, hey, don't meddle under the hood of the human body. You know, that kind of stuff. That warning never comes up. It's always nukes, and it's interesting because nukes are what humans think of as an existential threat. And these other things aren't really on the human radar, but they should be on these other beings' radar because this was their key problem. Yeah, you are right. You don't really hear that repeated, do you? Now. This may be a key reason for them, perhaps, in my opinion, beginning some kind of revelation of themselves more, where they are interacting more and more, from what I can tell, with paranormal research groups. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just going to say, there's a, I don't know if listeners will be familiar with them, they might be, because the guy's really popular these days and their channel's really exploding there, but the twin paranormal YouTube channel, Twin Paranormal. It's new to me, so I'm assuming it's new to a chunk of the audience too. A group of young guys from Nevada that they're probably in their 20s or something like that, but they use a lot of interesting toys and gadgets to wander around to paranormal hotspots and haunted places. Now, I've been watching them for a little while now. Now, they usually operate under the presumption that they're interacting with deceased humans, and most of the questions they ask are sort of aligned to that. This is what's motivating for them the most part, that they're contacting ghosts. When I watch their series, I see them contacting crypto-terrestrials, the Majina. For the most part, in my opinion, most of their paranormal activities and, and places that they visit, they're having these intense interactions with crypto-terrestrials, with tall whites, cloaking, speaking to them through their like voice app devices and EVP stuff, and also running around them and making noises. Even even the most recent episode was very interesting because there was the chirping, growling, and also at one stage, right near the end of the episode, they hear in the distance what they think is laughter, but to me, 
it sounds very much like these uh, high-pitched sort of monkey-like or fox-like sounds that they make as well. So they're having massive, massive crypto terrestrial contact every episode they put on pretty much. And also, you know, Trey Hudson that wrote The Meadow Project, he's investigating a paranormal hotspot that he likens to Skinwalker Ranch, but it's somewhere in the south in the States, but he doesn't let the cat out of the bag to exactly where it is because he, he doesn't want people to rush over there and spoil this interesting little patch. But in his book, it's definitely the Mudgener, in my opinion, the Crypto Terrestrials. He even found and took a photo and put it in his book, The Meadow Project, a photo of a, it's a rock, it's a sculpture of a head, and it is very, very close to a boa suit head. It even has like the long nose with the flared out part. It sort of looks like a nose of a proboscis monkey or something. It even has at the top of its head, running up from the nose, a distended part, which is the top section of the nose. And he and his paranormal research group have been having high level contact with them. One of their group even got abducted and was taken on a trip around the valley while the others were away and then had his had himself returned with his memory wiped, but they could tell from his satnap stuff that he had on him that he'd been shooting all over the valley. <laughs> really, really interesting stuff. Also, they heard the samurai chatter, you know, like the Orions or the crypto terrestrials, the Mudjana. Words for the same thing. They make a lot of camouflage sounds, so he heard them chirping, whistling, meowing, and things like that. He had a guy there with him at the time that was that was a bit of a bird nerd, so he, he knew a lot of about different bird calls and things like that, and he was saying that the one of the bird noises they were hearing really shouldn't be that high. The elevation was too high, it should be, you know, high in the mountain. And so that was a bit odd. But um they also heard the typical tall white language, samurai chatter, like the Sierra sounds. The Sierra sounds are not Sasquatch, they're definitely tall whites. The sounds, I don't know if people listening to your show, Greg, are probably familiar with Ron Moorhead and Al Berry recording these sounds in the Sierra Mountains in the early 70s, Sierra Nevada Mountains. Sure, yeah. And they sound like really deep resonating, almost like a samurai sound, like in sort of Japanese being spoken in a very sort of aggressive, masculine kind of way. It sort of sounds like that. Also coupled with sort of coughing and barking sounds and whistling and monkey-like sounds and fox-like sounds and all this kind of stuff is definitely, definitely tall white. And I even talked to Ron Moorhead about this and said, hey, I don't think there's a Sasquatch, dude. This is tall whites. And he said, well, he doesn't know what was doing it in the end. All he knows is whatever was making the sound had really big feet. And tall whites have huge feet anyway, so that's fair enough. But he also was experiencing sophisticated, high technology orbs. You know, these guys, they weren't just hearing these sounds that they thought were Sasquatch or whatever. They were seeing orbs and UFOs. Ron Moorhead as well talks about something that looked kind of like the blade of a lightsaber, just the light without the handle, slowly cruising across the top of the surface of the ground, like maybe it was scanning the ground. Hearing these humming sounds coming from in the earth or a treetop level. Humming sounds is indicative of an underground mudgeon habitation as well. It, it, this crops up in lots and lots of different cases. Sometimes sounding like it's coming from within the earth or sometimes up above you at treetop level. But the activity, sorry, the point I was trying to make is the activity is all ramping up at the moment. And what you were saying as well about the genetics, if I can bring it back to that, sorry, I was rambling a bit there. Sure. The genetics, <laughs> um, the genetic issues, this might be all part of it where they are deciding they can't have us not only using nukes or degrading the environment or whatever in general through pollution and consumerism and whatnot, but but also they can't have us beginning an enterprise into changing our genomes because they require our genomes to be natural. Otherwise, we're worthless to them. Ah, yes. Well, maybe there's hope for me getting a visitation yet because I am still a pureblood, as they say now. <laughs> <laughs> Man. I definitely appreciate your book and your research and sharing your personal experiences with these future humans. I know you have plans for future books as well. Anything to say to the people in that regard as we're wrapping this up? Yeah, I'm currently writing the second one. 
And I've been doing a lot of thinking about it for the past year or so, but only just really started putting pen to paper in the last couple of months. I'm not sure how long that one will take me to write. Depends on how much free time I have. The last one I wrote really quickly, but then it was put off for a year because of COVID. Mm -hmm. But the current book that's available, it's on Amazon. And yeah, check it out, dudes. It's mm -hmm. there. It's paperback, hardback, ebook. And I'm happy to say that in the pipeline, there's a gentleman that's been hired to do the audio book. And I don't know how long that will be, but at some stage there'll be an audio version too, which is sweet. Nice, nice. And so, yes, I loved Children of Orion. People should pick it up. A very well laid out case and a deep dive into a lot of other experiencers stories that maybe we forgot or haven't visited in a while so i highly recommend it and is there any uh links or contact info to leave people with i don't know if you want to get contacted but it's always good to ask well i've got a youtube channel if people are interested in checking that out which is just my name ryan musgrave evans and i am on facebook if people want to send me a message or something no worries that'd be cool but awesome. yeah, check out my channel for those people interested. I've got vlogs and things like that on there and a few old documentaries that are relevant. And I make a video maybe once a week or something. Right on. Awesome. Well, it's definitely been a pleasure. You are a special person to have these experiences. Best of luck out there and let me know when the new book comes out. And, you know, I know you are in Australia. Whatever you think about the the big show going on, definitely keep your spirits high. It might be, it might be uh, a little tough right now. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, cheers. It's been good fun. Oh, yeah, I'll right get on. in contact with you again. We'll stay in touch, hey? Yes, for sure. All right, take care. Okay, thanks, man. I loved it. Big fan of this one, guys. Happy to get it out there. In my attempt to alternate between the Big Agenda and non-Big Agenda related interviews, this one certainly scratched an itch. I've been intrigued by the idea of crypto-terrestrials ever since I heard the term, that these advanced beings could actually be native to the Earth. I don't see why not. And when we talk to guests about fairies and angels and aliens all being in a sort of spiritual context, I think that's what we're getting at, that they are from, quote-unquote, here, in a sense. I'm open to a lot of possibilities, and I know what I'm saying right now goes against this perspective that Ryan just spent all this time laying out, but the best way I get my head around it all is to think that the physical world is nested inside of a soup of ether or consciousness, and that these beings we encounter are actually more native to that soup than they are the earth, per se, or any physical place, for that matter. And if the fabric of consciousness is primary, beings that are rooted in that primary layer could pop in over here. <laughs> I think it could go a long way into explaining why these encounters are always with us. It explains why we don't see this big technological footprint or any kind of active civilization that would be stumbled upon. It's why these encounters seem sort of timeless, or that the technology that is seen in these encounters seems out of place for the era. But hey, that's just a framework that I use to try to understand this stuff. Ryan is the one with the first-hand encounters, more of a relationship, really, than just encounters. And just because Ryan has a relationship with one thing, doesn't mean there aren't other things as well. I'm just spitballing here, and all I can really do is try to incorporate this new information with the place that I was previously. And if I had to guess at the criticism that would be most prominent for this one, it's that this overall premise puts paranormal activity and encounters back into a materialist context the very context that we're usually trying to get away from. So I could see some people being like, wait a minute, you've been saying it's more this, and now you're saying it's more that? But whatever, it's important to stay open-minded. I think I've learned over the years that this isn't something I'm ever really going to solve, quote-unquote. 
We just have to keep examining it from different angles, and some will seem like they get closer to the heart of things more than others. I even told Ryan that the part I thought people would struggle with most is chalking so much of the oddness of these experiences up to a uh, technology, or that the red eyes people report are just goggles in a suit. I don't know about that. Ryan says he's seen the suits, and I really haven't seen shit. So what do I know? But I would think that even in these epic encounters, people are perceptive enough to distinguish a suit from an oftentimes naked in appearance type of being, right? But if they're tapping into our minds and making a flash judgment to appear in some specific way, maybe that's why we don't recognize the suits in a lot of cases. But another thing I liked about Ryan is that for some of these out-of-the-box or critical questions, he just says, yeah, that is interesting. I don't really know why that is. Maybe this, maybe that, they haven't really said. But even on top of the personal experiences, he's just a solid researcher on this stuff. He's got great recall. He focuses on some really interesting cases in ufology history. I think he's going to get a nice bump from the people who were really into this. And I hope so. Tell Ryan you enjoyed it if you did and check out his book. And as much as this was supposed to avoid the big themes of our times... These beings say they screwed themselves up with too much genetic tinkering, and I really wanted to make sure we got that question into the first hour, because these interactions through the 50s, right on up to the 90s, I guess, tend to warn us about nuclear destruction, which was an existential fear in the cultural zeitgeist that really peaked during those times and has been in decline kind of ever since. It's not a concern that's 100% gone, but it's certainly not on the radar in the same way in the last two decades or so. So it's just a little bit odd to me that the messages in these encounters or the nuclear site flyovers, it's always been about the nukes. But that isn't what screwed these beings up. If they had seeded warnings about CRISPR and genomic alteration, in those earlier accounts, I think that would have been a real head-scratcher in the 60s and 70s and 80s for the average guy. But today, we would look back at those cases and say, okay, this is exactly what those warnings were about now that we're here. Kudos to them for getting ahead of it. Clearly, this phenomenon is legitimate because they were raising the alarm about a problem that wasn't even a part of our world yet. As a way to legitimize these experiences to more people, it would be nice if we had that. And I hope I'm explaining myself well here. I'm not trying to dismantle or pick apart Ryan's perspective. It's just the biggest question I have. Why not warn us about the actual problem and the realm of science that caused you guys to have to embed yourselves here? Who knows? Maybe they're just trying to highlight one potentially world-ending technological disaster at a time. Another thought is that maybe these beings are embedded in our subconscious somehow. Like the concept of the holy guardian angel, maybe they emerge from a deep, deep part of the self that acts as a type of mirror? And it doesn't know what it doesn't know? Huh, whatever the whole thing is, I think it's way too complex for a simple answer. And that's good for me, because we'll never run out of ways to look at it. <laughs> But I love Ryan's insights. I love hearing about his own experiences. And kudos to him for putting those experiences last in the book. I do think he's pretty humble and matter-of-fact about it. This book didn't at all seem like ego service, and that's kind of rare in this world of otherworldly being encounter books. I've read enough to know. And as you guys are aware, I'm always looking for ways to make this stuff fresh. And I think Ryan has done it. But if you like the first hour, sign up for Plus to hear the second. I got a baby on the way any day now. Society is on shaky ground. If you can throw me a bone because you value this show over others, please do. Today's second hour was full of good stuff like the Dan Burrish disclosures and how they relate to Ryan's contact. Inner Earth Stargates and Sumerian Tablets, 
a deeper dive into the rich experiences Ryan has had with these beans all his life, Branu, Joseph, and Butterfly, crypto-terrestrial insights into the post-death experience, where the crypto-terrestrials live. Apparently, they have a hot spot between Ryan and Gordon. <laughs> Their relationship to ancient megalithic sites, nuances of beans and belief systems, and what the governments know. Very provocative stuff to add to the stack. Don't let yourself miss out. Huge thanks to those who are keeping their memberships alive in trying times. You can prioritize a lot of things, and I'm lucky to have THC be one of them. And that's going to do it. Several other shows have been recorded. I am happy with all of them. I am going to get them rolling out to you as soon as I can. But that's it for me. Ryan Musgrave Evans, once again, let's hear it. I'm sure a lot of you guys will be pondering some of these things that Ryan said for a while. I know I have been. But I'm out. I've done my part. Your move, future selves, beings from beyond, and crypto terrestrials from the troubled timeline. Your fucking move. When you see weird lights outside of your door, something sits on your chest when you sleep. It might be a pattern you've been through before. Mm -hmm. Oh, you might have those screen memories. And darling, wait till we get some proof. Still, we'll make them see. And baby, I tried the camera. Died, I'm not crazy. as